It was a tense scene in the city of Culiacan, Mexico, as a group of officers surrounded a home with their weapons drawn. And that tension was more than justified, as the officers were soon to become part of history, taking down one of the most notorious criminals in the region, a man named Ovidio Guzman Lopez, the son of Joaquin Guzman, also known as El Chapo. There he is, the man known as El Chapo, finally back in custody after 13 years on the run since bribing his way out of prison. Despite his father having been arrested back in 2014, Ovidio was still a free man, continuing his father's legacy by taking a lead role in the cartel. But this day was set to be his last as a free man, as officers prepared to enter the home and detain Ovidio. The sting itself was supposedly set up by the Mexican government as a way to halt the cartel's reign over the region. And for the cops partaking in this daring moment, they were set to be heroes should it all go off without a hitch. In that day, that's exactly what would happen. As Ovidio was taken into custody and the scene was secured, without a single shot being fired, making what should have been a huge win for the Mexican government, had the story ended there. The city of Culiacan, Mexico, the historic homeland to the violent Sinaloa drug cartel, turned into a battle zone Thursday. The city quickly became a war zone, with the cartel sending over 700 armed soldiers in retaliation against the arrest of Ovidio, all despite the fact that officers had actually made Ovidio call off any such actions by the cartel, as shown in the end of this body cam footage though they refused to listen. And within hours, the military in the region was completely overwhelmed. And with the city in absolute chaos and countless fatalities looming in the distance, the Mexican government would make a shocking decision to allow Ovidio Guzman to walk free. The move was stunning, though it did immediately quell the fighting in the region, and for a moment, all seemed calm. Though in the minds of the cartel members, things were nowhere near even. Which brings us back to this video. In it, we see multiple officers taking part in the operation, with the leader of it all being a man named Eduardo. And though these officers likely thought that their actions that day would make them heroes, this decision would instead make them hunted. Just days after the botched arrest, Eduardo would be stalked and confronted by armed members of the cartel, who would open fire in a hailstorm of bullets when the man was in his car. In total, 155 shots were fired at Eduardo, who never stood a chance. And the horrors of this video don't end there, as despite Eduardo being the only officially confirmed death of all of these officers, it has been heavily rumored that in the time since the recording, every single one of the officers seen in this clip have since been killed, as they became the cartel's easiest form of revenge against the police, being picked off one by one to send a message to the whole world. And watching this clip back and seeing just how calm Ovidio was during his arrest, I have to believe that he knew that this was going to happen. And though he was the one being arrested, it really seemed like it was the police that had fallen into his trap, making this yet another example of the disturbed content found across the depths of YouTube. Depths in which today we are yet again diving into as we look to discover more of YouTube's darkest videos. <laughs> Again to all my friends, I'm glad you came to play. Our fun and learning never end. Here's what we did today. I just have a couple questions for you. Here we are again, Regent. There's no place that I'd rather be because the Christmas spirit here is just unbelievable. Since its inception, YouTube has been used as a launching ground for aspiring performers to have their work noticed by the masses. But for every success story you see across the site, there are hundreds of thousands of others who will land well short of achieving that fame. And lost in the crowd of these nameless faces was an aspiring rapper named Math Boy Fly. His real name is Daryl Brooks, a now 39-year-old man who had spent most of his life on the wrong side of the law. 
At the age of just 17, he would pick up his first felony for battery, and from there, he would never really get his life back on track, picking up fresh charges on a regular basis. By 2007, Daryl's life was in a total freefall, as he had become addicted to meth while picking up his most serious conviction yet for rape against a minor, which not only landed him in prison, but it also landed him on the sex offender registry. Clearly, Daryl was a disturbed man, dealing with some extremely dark personal demons, which just so happened to be captured by a film crew, who at the time were documenting the struggles of meth addiction. The movie's name is Crystal Darkness, and in it, we see a short segment showing Daryl in prison, sharing how he had abandoned his kid due to his addiction, while expressing regret that he couldn't give his child a better life. You know, I got this, I got this beautiful kid who's, who's going without my time. I, I thought I would just be this wonderful father, this, just be the greatest dad ever. I'm gonna give him everything that I didn't have. But then it's like, reality set in. In an interview years later, the director of the project, a man named Logan Needham, described Daryl as seemingly genuine in his pursuit to turn his life around, stating, I felt like he definitely had remorse, and I think he felt bad about the decisions he had made to land him where he was. However, Daryl would never turn this new leaf. And once he was released, his dangerous behavior only got worse, as time and time again, he would find himself back behind bars, facing charges like strangulation, domestic abuse, and bail jumping. Though he didn't let these endless legal troubles get in the way of his one true dream, a dream that he believed would finally bring him some semblance of success in this world, with that being to become a famous rapper. And so he took on the nickname Math Boy Fly and began posting his music to YouTube, where we find what would one day become one of the darkest videos on the site. I just got a low worth about a half a ticket. 30 in the clicker when I'm out here chasing chicken. Was observant to the game when I used to play the benches. Now I swipe the Vinci, got him looking at me different. The video was posted back in the summer of 2018 and featured Daryl's song, Half a Ticket. The video features a lot of your standard music video visuals, though ultimately nothing really stands out all that much upon first viewing, aside from how bad it sounds. But today, this clip is viewed in a far different manner. Around the time of its release, something was brewing inside of Daryl. His life was at a dead end and he knew it, leading to his violent temper growing worse and worse by the day. In 2020, Daryl would be arrested for firing a shot at his nephew during an argument. And though the bullet thankfully missed the man, Daryl would still be faced with 10 years in prison as police discovered that the gun he had used was actually stolen, along with a large amount of meth being found in Daryl's pocket, which all cultivated into the prospect of a lengthy prison sentence. Though due to issues with the pandemic, Daryl would eventually be allowed to leave police custody as his bail had been reduced to just $500. Unsurprisingly, this would further enable Daryl's behavior and the following year, he would yet again be arrested. In this particular case, Daryl had been in his car stalking his ex-girlfriend, who was also the mother of his child, before pulling up alongside her and demanding that she get in. Concerned for her safety, the woman refused to enter the car, to which Daryl reacted by running her over. Thankfully, this woman too would survive the ordeal, though shockingly, despite Daryl's constant run-ins with the law, as well as this crime having taken place when he was literally already on bail, he would yet again avoid jail time, as his bail was, in this case, set at just $1,000. Free again, Daryl likely began to think that he was above the law, which paired with his escalating anger would unsurprisingly lead to one more violent outburst. Though what was surprising was just how violent it would be. On November 21st, 2021, days after Daryl's most recent arrest, police would be called to the home of his ex-girlfriend as they had yet again gotten into another dispute. But this time, before things had gotten too far out of hand, Daryl stormed out, got into his car, and drove away. 
Though rather than this being some sign of restraint, this was instead seemingly part of a far more malicious decision, leading to one devastating event. <laughs> That day, Daryl Brooks would drive his car directly into the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade at speeds of over 40 miles per hour, driving in a zigzag pattern in an attempt to strike as many people as possible, none of whom Daryl had known personally, as this was simply an act of pure rage. The videos of this event and its aftermath are brutal, and it's something that I'm not allowed to fully show here. But in total, 62 people were struck, most of whom were children or senior citizens who were just trying to enjoy this beloved community celebration. And of these victims, sadly, six would perish. Following the tragedy, Daryl attempted to flee the area, even begging a stranger to let him into his home and to order him an Uber, which would be caught on a Ring doorbell camera, though he would quickly be captured by police soon after and is now facing a whopping 77 charges. And despite the leniency he's enjoyed from the court system over the years, it seems that this time, the judge will not show him that same type of mercy. I wasn't a human anymore. I was just something vile, disgusting, despicable. I could go, I could go on, I could use a lot of words, but that's, that's what I became. It's, it's really what I became. Knowing what Daryl has become and watching this documentary back with this context makes it a truly haunting watch as no one involved, not even Daryl himself, knew just how bad things would one day become. But there is a reason that I mention this seemingly obscure music video as being one of the darkest videos on the site, and it's for a reason that is very easy to look right over. I just got a low worth about a half a ticket. As Daryl is shown rapping in the video, within its background, we can see a red SUV. The same SUV that just a few years later would bring chaos, pain, and despair to a local parade, and ultimately end the lives of so many innocent people. We've had a great time, haven't we? That's right. Santa's out there with a lot of cheer and goodwill. Families can have lots of fun together, but sometimes we get angry at our brother, 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 brother. Our next video takes us all the way around the world to a little known village in northeastern Somalia called Halam. In October of 2021, a video from the region began circulating across the web, showcasing what appears to be an unremarkable scene playing out, as two men from the village were being interviewed separately. <laughs> As one of the men is seen talking, a few individuals appear behind him, working as if they were preparing for some sort of event, or perhaps just doing some farming. Given the language barrier and a lack of translation included, it's impossible to tell what these men are discussing upon an initial watch, and given just how normal it all seems, it offers little reason to be dove into any further had it not been for two bizarre details. For starters, the thumbnail is quite unusual, as it shows a man who is not featured within the video, tied up and clearly looking upset, while one of the men who is being interviewed is shown standing proudly alongside him. Making things even stranger, the title, which is written in Somali, translates to the fairly disturbing line, Garo, the killer of his mother, was shot dead today. Despite things appearing unremarkable in the video itself, the thumbnail and the title alone were enough to pique the interest of a select few who just so happened to stumble upon this practically unknown upload. And those who chose to dig any deeper would be greeted with the true horrors of the scene playing out before them. Upon performing a general Google search of the video's title, users will be greeted with a plethora of uploads featuring footage of the same event, one of which even showing footage of the man in the blue shirt tied up with his head down. 
طبعاً كي بيشي تطبع الله بكون يلا بعد الحكم دل أكون ردي فارع عبد محمد وهو يدي سكود دل يتولى كلام قبل كانوا قال وحاون دل كجيس تي تطبيع طبعاً كي بيشي اللي حال بكون يلا بعد and the results didn't stop there, as searching the title would also lead to the discovery of a multitude of articles that also depict this very event that we see unfolding, which would ultimately add clarity to the situation, as it was revealed that this bound man shown in the footage and the thumbnail was actually a cold-blooded killer. His name is Farah Abdi Mohammed, and during that previous summer, he had apparently fallen into what was described as a drug-fueled rage, which would ultimately end with him taking the life of his very own mother. And making matters even more tragic, he was one of seven siblings, meaning that six other individuals had lost their mother thanks to this man's disturbed behavior. The case went unnoticed by most outside media outlets, Though within this small village, it sent ripples across the community, as his crime was so heinous and his guilt was unquestionable. And with Farah quickly landing in custody, the question was then posed, what do we do with him now? Would prison really be enough of a punishment for this individual, or should he face the death penalty? Ultimately, authorities would leave this decision to the remaining siblings of Farah, who would be tasked with determining his fate and it was from these discussions that Farah's brother, a man named Awai, would come forward with the decision that Farah should suffer the same fate as their mother did, and that he should face execution. Though this wasn't all Awai had to say, as his decision came with a interesting proposal. He wanted to make a spectacle of the execution and send a message all across the region that those who take the lives of their mothers will have their own lives taken in return. And so, to assure that this was seen by the masses, and to prove just how serious Awai was with his message, he would request to be the executioner. So on October 17th, 2021, news cameras gathered in the town as Awai was interviewed in preparation to take the life of his own brother and the killer of his mother. As he's seen here even posing alongside Farah just moments before the execution, the situation is almost impossibly grim, and to make things just that much darker, those men seen working in the background of a wise interview were in fact helping to set up for the event, or at least the aftermath of it, as in actuality, they were quite literally digging Farah's grave right behind his own brother, with Farah watching it all happen just off camera. And so, in the moments following this footage, Awai was handed a gun, which he would press against the head of his brother Farah and pull the trigger. The layers to this clip are almost incomprehensible, especially considering how calm everyone seems in the minutes leading to this execution. I mean, even Farah, whose life was soon to end, seemed to show no panic whatsoever, despite his grave literally being dug right before his eyes yet no one seemed to show any sort of emotion. It's almost like everyone understood their roles and accepted what needed to be done, leading to this one unconventional, yet almost indescribably disturbing video. We'll show you how to make all kinds of delicious things to eat. This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a service that sends fresh, pre-portioned ingredients along with delicious recipes directly to your house. These recipes are incredibly diverse, with the chefs over at HelloFresh providing you with great seasonal spring recipes like sweet heat shrimp tempura bowls, garden spinach ricotta ravioli, and one pot creamy lemon dill chicken soup. On top of all that, these recipes require hardly any prep time at all and make cleanup easier than ever, while also being up to 72 percent cheaper than dining out at a restaurant. So overall, you're saving a ton of time with cooking alone and even some money too. But for me, the best part of this service is that I can finally stop worrying about what I'm going to be eating for dinner. I mean, that's something I spend so much time overthinking about, but with HelloFresh, I can avoid that daily dilemma for good, as they offer a whopping 50 weekly meal options that I can select from all in advance. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, then head over to HelloFresh.com and use the code Crowley16 to get up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. That is HelloFresh.com and the code Crowley16. If we think about what we like about our brother, we won't stay angry very long. I'm glad when friends make up and share a hug.
You know, it's God who created these bodies of ours, and it's God who blesses them, and with his help, keep these bodies working in optimum condition. February 13th, 2014. A man named Kevin Bennett approaches a busy intersection on his way to work in the city of Hampton, Missouri. The morning commute had gone just like any other. Typical traffic, fair weather, and on the corner of the intersection, a man was dancing. He was a well-known figure in the area, or at least his performances were, as virtually every morning he would be there, not saying a word, not begging for money, just simply dancing. Like many others, Kevin found the man to be uniquely charming, and so he decided to film that morning's performance and post it to YouTube for others to see. I'm dancing, man. Getting after it this morning. Putting out the good vibes for all the computers. The video was met with over 10,000 views and even led to a mention in the local news reports, as collectively, the community wanted to know who exactly this man was. <laughs> no one knew it then, but this man's name is actually Seth Herter, and what they were witnessing wasn't some type of light-hearted dance routine, but rather the deterioration of a man's mind, which was playing out in real time. Hi everyone. My name's Seth Herter. At the time, Seth was an unemployed man in his late 20s who had been struggling with multiple psychological conditions, leading to his behavior becoming somewhat erratic as time passed. This was cataloged throughout his frequent postings across the web, where he would type bizarre religious ramblings claiming that Jesus would soon be returning to Earth alongside intergalactic beings. But sifting through countless posts of this same vein, Seth actually mentioned his daily dance routine on a few separate occasions, referring to it not just as a performance, but also as some sort of religious ritual that he was using to spread his message. And though this message was never expressly stated, most would assume that it was based around the idea of peace, as he would often say things like, I love all beings forever, and seek never to kill, nor harm, nor destroy any living thing, no tree, nor bird, nor bee, nor dragonfly. However, as time passed, he would slowly drift away from this particular belief. Throughout much of Seth's adult life, he struggled to hold down consistent residency, being evicted time and time again for things such as noise complaints and heavy smoking. And by 2018, Seth had again found himself moving into a brand new apartment. And it was within those walls that his behavior would take a troubling turn. Almost immediately, neighbors in his complex began complaining about Seth's behavior, stating that he had been seen multiple times running down the hallway over and over again with a katana in his hand. Even more bizarrely, others claimed to have seen him standing behind the apartment building, alone in the dead of night, standing there in complete darkness, brandishing his sword and just dancing, alone in the dark, for hours and hours on end with him appearing to be in some sort of trance-like state, completely unresponsive to the world around him. And his behavior didn't stop there, as seemingly out of the blue, Seth began verbally harassing his neighbors and starting fights over seemingly nothing at all, where he was said to have displayed a genuine and even frightening anger that seemed to be growing more and more uncontrollable. Though it's hard to say for sure what exactly was on Seth's mind during this time, as he had abandoned all of his social media in the years prior, leaving what had once been his daily blog and his Twitter account completely dormant, and practically stopping his trail across the entire internet. With the exception of one site. As for whatever reason, Seth seemed to take a liking to one unique platform during all of this, with that site being Amazon. Seth was an avid reviewer across Amazon, leaving his thoughts on the various religious texts and tokens that he had purchased prior to the height of his manic episodes, which is all fine and well, but starting in 2018, his purchases and reviews began to grow worrisome. For instance, in March of that year, Seth had purchased and reviewed a pair of industrial strength metal handcuffs, which he reviewed by saying, strong metal, good case, be careful. 
On another occasion, he had purchased a set of knives, throwing blades, and his katana that he had used multiple times across his apartment building, referring to the sword as amazing, stating that, for $20, it really is an excellent blade. I am very impressed with the quality. The tip was razor sharp and easily capable of penetrating most targets I put it up against. Once again, a great purchase for $20, very capable of killing. It is a fighting blade for sure. The post was also accompanied by a photo of himself with the weapon in his hand. There are some definite red flags here in his reviews, but the most disturbing example of all would come just a month later, as Seth would describe his experience with a specific taser that he had purchased by saying, I bought this exact stun gun model. In a fit of rage, I shocked myself in the face and neck about 30 times with the units. It left visible welts on my chest and neck. The stun gun is effective. It has a loud audible snap that really goes straight to the dark parts of someone's psyche. It really is a potent psychological defense weapon. He then followed up this post by saying that shocking himself was exhilarating to say the least. The items in which Seth had been purchasing and the subsequent reviews he had left for them were clearly very concerning. But for those who knew him personally, things were actually becoming even more frightening. As around this time, Seth would call his father to explain that Jesus had spoken to him and had selected him to carry out certain tasks, claiming that he was the chosen one and that it was time to start punishing people. Seth's father would immediately contact authorities as he was unsure of what his son's intentions were, though nothing would be done about it, leaving the door wide open for Seth's punishments to begin. On the evening of May 2nd, 2018, Seth invited his ex-boyfriend, Christopher, to his apartment, begging the man to come over and claiming that the CIA was listening to his thoughts. And sensing that Seth was clearly in need of help, Christopher agreed to stop by, a decision that would ultimately backfire, as once together, the two quickly began to argue, leading to an all-out shouting match that soon turned physical. And in a fit of rage, Seth would grab his katana and in an instant, begin attacking, slicing Christopher over and over and over again. And as it turns out, Seth's review was in fact accurate, and his katana was certainly capable of killing. The scene would be discovered days later, when maintenance workers were confronted with the carnage in the unit, while on the ground was Christopher's lifeless body. Despite an attempt to flee, Seth Herter was caught soon after inflicting this punishment and later claimed that it was all done in a fit of delusion. With Christopher having unfortunately been caught in his crossfire, with more victims likely to have followed had it not been for his capture, has given his need to inflict pain onto the world, as well as the concerning items that he had purchased throughout Amazon, who knows what else he was capable of. It's pretty jarring seeing this man who was once known for his cheerful dancing, becoming a convicted killer who will likely never see the outside of a prison again. But throughout the whole case, there's still one question that looms over everything. The dancing. Why did he do it? What was the message behind it all? Well, this would actually be answered by Seth himself during an interview in late 2018, as following his heinous crime, he stated how he believed he was the chosen one, hand selected by God, but not as some second coming of Jesus or anything like that, but rather, he believed he was the Antichrist, a figure chosen to bring pain and suffering onto the world. And with this mindset, Seth referred to his dancing by saying, that was me going out in public and demonstrating to people that I was the Antichrist. In his mind, the dancing was a test, and if people took notice, it meant that they were recognizing his powers. And the more they recognized this, the more he believed these powers to be real. Every honk, every shout from a window, every picture taken was ultimately further supporting this man's delusion, pushing him closer and closer to the brink of complete insanity, validating and even feeding these dark thoughts that were consuming him, and the further it drove him to kill. And all the while, no one knew it. They all thought they were being friendly and supporting these lighthearted performances. 
And darkest of all, this video taken by Kevin Bennett on the morning of February 13th, 2014, the seemingly harmless, wholesome clip from the very beginning was in all actuality Seth Herter's magnum opus. As between the views it garnered and the newspaper article that stemmed from it, this is what he viewed as the ultimate recognition of his powers, with him even admitting that this was the most overwhelming piece of confirmation in his mind that he was actually the Antichrist, which eventually led him to take the life of an innocent man. Good, can you say with me, he grants me according to the riches of his glory. Say that with me. He grants me. Today was going to be a big day for me. It was my first trip away from home. Love me sweet lover. It was a day of celebration for David Turpin and his wife, Louise, another in a long line of wedding anniversaries that they'd celebrate by renewing their vows in Vegas. And to make the moment even more special, they were able to do so with their 13 children in attendance. When they first married all the way back in 1985, David was just a 23-year-old man, and Louise was a 16-year-old child. And despite all the years that had passed, it seemed the love they had for each other was still very much blossoming, as they renewed their vows to each other in this same manner practically every year, as shown in other clips scattered across YouTube. And aside from the love they had for each other, these videos also seemed to show the love they had for their children. As together, the group seemed to form a massive yet close-knit family unit, known as the Turpin family. And these clips would be just the start of their long trail left here on YouTube. Sometime following these various clips being left across the internet, one of the daughters shown within this old footage would begin uploading videos of her own life to a secret channel that at the time only she knew of. The then 17-year-old's name is Jordan Turpin, and across her page, she would post videos of herself singing original songs in her bedroom. But it's over, it's over, it's over. While showing incredibly brief glimpses into her home life, And as a whole, these videos seem nothing too out of the ordinary, especially for a 17-year-old girl, with her uploads eventually coming to an end following the posting of yet another singing video. And throughout the channel's lifespan, there really are no obvious red flags that could point to any concerning activity happening behind the scenes. As aside from a few moments here and there, Jordan never really opened up to the camera or revealed any details about her personal life, as for the most part, she only used the page for her music, making it practically impossible to tell that in reality, something unbelievably sinister was transpiring within the walls of the Turpin home, with it having gone unnoticed for years before and what would have likely been years later, had it not been for the actions of Jordan. As just one week after her final upload, a call would be made to 911 from the young lady herself. This is 911, do you have an emergency? Uh, I just went away from home because I live in a family of 15. We have abusing parents. Did you hear that? They hit us, they throw us across they like to throw us across the room. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. My two little sisters right now are chained up. In this clip, we hear the audio from Jordan's call to the local police station as she attempts to explain that her parents had not only been abusing her, but all of her siblings as well. Given the severity of the claim, an officer would immediately be sent to meet with Jordan, who had been standing outside in a nearby neighborhood, with the entire interaction being captured on the officer's body camera. What's going on? Okay. I just ran away from home. Okay. And I live in a family of 15. Okay. My two little sisters right now are chained up. They're chained up? Yes. Where are they chained up at? On their bed. They're chained up because they stole mother's food. Okay. But they stole it because they were hungry. Jordan explains to the officer that two of her siblings were currently chained to their beds, all because they had attempted to steal some of their mother's food. 
Even more shockingly, Jordan explains that her nervous and oftentimes awkward behavior was due to the fact that she had never really met anyone from the outside world. I'm sorry if I talk too much. I've never talked to anybody out there, so I don't, I don't I've never been alone with a person, so this is very hard for me to talk and that in order for her to get help, she literally had to escape from her own home, as she was never allowed to leave. And the reason I managed to get out here, this is one of the most scary things I've ever done. Uh -huh. I'm terrified. Initially, the officer was a bit hesitant, even questioning whether Jordan was on medication, to which she responded in a confused manner, due to the fact that she had never even heard that word before. Do you take any medication? What's medication? Medication? Yeah, what's medication? Do you take pills? Do you take pills? And ultimately, the man eventually realizes just how serious the situation was, as Jordan actually came with proof. I don't have proof of everything, but I have proof that my sisters are chained up. Look at that. See, those are the places that make an omen. And see how dirty she is? We're so filthy. We, we, we don't take baths. We don't. How did your sisters get like this? Your parents yeah, chained them up? Yes. The whole ordeal was shocking, though it was only part of the story, as when police entered the home that very night, they discovered the full scope of the abuse that had been taking place within that building. Inside, officers would be greeted with the overwhelming scent of excrement and garbage, which was covering practically the entirety of the house. They would also find 12 other siblings, one of whom had been chained up for weeks, and two others that had just recently been freed. The children were malnourished beyond belief, and incredibly frail, and much to the shock of the officers, some of them were actually adults, with the oldest being 29 years old, though had been mistakenly believed to be a child, as they had weighed only 89 pounds, due to the fact that the children were only allowed to eat a small amount just once per day. The children were all covered in bruises, which had come from the constant beatings from their parents, while also being covered in filth, as individually, the kids were only allowed one shower, not per day and not per week, but per year. The abuse that had gone on in the Turpin family home at the hands of both Luis and David was truly unthinkable, with perhaps the most egregious crime being committed by Luis, as on many occasions, she was said to have prostituted multiple of her children to wealthy men, and all in order to earn more money for the family while the couple otherwise kept the children locked within the home for the entirety of their lives, torturing them beyond belief, despite the fact that on social media, they would post photos portraying them as a perfect loving unit. Which leads me back to the trail of videos left behind on YouTube. For starters, you may be wondering how these children were able to attend these wedding ceremonies if they were truly never allowed to leave the house. Well, these clips actually show what may very well be the only times in these kids' lives that they were ever allowed to leave their home, as once a year they were allowed to go to this ceremony, not as a reward or anything like that, but to disguise the Turpins as being a happy family. This footage quite literally shows some of the only moments of freedom within these children's entire life up until this point. And as for the videos that Jordan had posted to her YouTube channel, well, there's a reason that I said that it was a secret page that only she knew of, because social media or contact from the outside world in any form was strictly prohibited throughout the house. And if her parents had known about this channel, it's likely that she would have faced unimaginable punishment. However, this didn't stop Jordan from uploading these clips, with them likely being a desperate attempt to be heard from anyone else out there in the world that she had forever been kept from. And in many ways, this displays the bravery that Jordan clearly had within her, and the bravery that would eventually lead to her taking the ultimate risk, breaking free of the home and saving her siblings from this torture. And if she hadn't done this, it's likely the kids would have remained imprisoned to this day. The full case of the Turpin family is a rabbit hole far too extensive to fully explain here, but eventually the parents would wind up going to trial, where it would be decided that they would spend the rest of their lives in prison. And though this tragic case has forever left an impact on the 13 children involved, we can at least take some solace in the fact that this torture is over now. Or at least it should have been.
A foster family in Paris has been accused of abusing several foster children, including some of the Turpin siblings. In what would become the most tragic twist imaginable in a case like this, it was just recently revealed that the foster family who had taken five of the Turpin children has now been accused of abusing those very kids. The parents, Marcelino Olgan and Rosa Olgan, along with their son Lenny, are all facing over a dozen charges, including child cruelty, witness intimidation, and false imprisonment. And making matters even more demented is the fact that the father, Marcelino, was additionally charged with performing lewd acts on a minor, as it's been alleged that he actually molested two of the children. It is just such a tragic revelation to come from an already sickening case, and the fact that this was able to happen to these kids again is some of the most disheartening news that I have ever heard. And I hate to leave this video off on such an awful note, so I do want to say that some of the Turpin children have gone on to live their own lives, that thankfully have been free of abuse, as Jordan herself has actually become a star on TikTok and is clearly thriving given her newfound freedom. So it isn't all horribly depressing, but some of it sadly is, and I hope that the remaining children can finally be placed in a loving environment, free of the abuse that has plagued their life, quite literally since the moment they were born. Time for bed, Granny said. Granny tucked me in, kissed me goodnight, sleep tight, she said. But I did not sleep tight. I thought about home. And the more I thought, the sadder I felt. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons. Alexander Duran, America's Grumpy Uncle, Bazoo42, Biznacker, Bray, Karen S, Daniel Binge, Donovan Aaron, Emmanuel Kadena, Game Gamer, Jake Parsons, Jay Money, John Stuart Muller, Joined in Harmony, Catherine Ross, Larry Matingley, Lacey, Mark PH, Max, Mycrafty Ways, Nathan Backus, Phoenix Morgan, Sam Lutfi, Soralis, Scar77, Skelly, Sub to Micro O, Unblended Corchnoy, Zinsu Sensei, and Trucky Doggo.